Let's open our Bibles to the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to John, John chapter 21. At the end of chapter 20 in verse 31, the last verse of chapter 20, last week, John writes that he had written these things that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing we would have life in his name. That seems to me to be the natural place where maybe John should have ended his gospel. You know, had John looked at me and if I would have been standing there, I would have said, well, you know, that's good. Let's put a, the end, you know, they lived happily ever after kind of a deal. And then, you know, on to first, second, and third John, I suppose. But he continues on in chapter 21 and probably for a number of reasons. I think that first of all, He's going to be combating a first century cult that was starting to take shape and beginning to, to establish roots. It would really blossom in the second century. Uh, and, and I think we'll see that, that combating of that uh, uh, cult here in the entire scene, really, in chapter 21. I think another reason why he writes chapter 21 is there was a misunderstanding that had started concerning something that Jesus had said about John that created a rumor in the early church. And so here now in chapter 21, John is going to try and clear up that rumor that was started about him. We'll see that next week in the conclusion to our study. I think probably a third reason he writes chapter 21 is to really redeem the ministry of Peter. Okay? Because of his thrice denial of Jesus, there are probably those that would call into question Peter's ministry, right? Because he denied the Lord three times, there are those that would, would seek to attack the credibility of Peter, who is going to be a leader in the church. So, you know, here John is going to show the definite commission that the Lord puts on Peter's life, the recommissioning, if you will, after the fall of Peter. And of course... In this, we see the God of second chances, do we not? And third, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth, ad infinitum. And so he's dealing with a cult, he's dealing with a rumor, and he's dealing with the recommissioning of Peter. These are some of the reasons I think John continues uh, to be inspired to write chapter 21. And yet, I think maybe the most important reason the Holy Spirit in inspires John to continue writing here is to bring forth just an incredible, insightful lesson and teaching upon the idea of Christian service. This has got to be, as I told you last week, one of my very favorite chapters in, in all of the Bible, uh, you know, for a Bible teacher to teach upon because it's so very rich and so very thick and, and so incredibly practical and insightful for you and I. Uh, for you and I. Now, I also think the order in which, if you consider last week's study, the order in which the Holy Spirit is presenting this material to you and I is very telling as well. You remember Christ appeared to these guys, he made his presence known, and then we read immediately there was that joy. He said, peace be with you. He then breathed upon them and filled them with the Holy Spirit. What's interesting is the order between then and here. Last week he fills them with the Holy Spirit, brings them peace, and now this week he, he begins to teach them on Christian service. Make sense? So there's that filling with the Holy Spirit, and now he's teaching them, having filled them, on this idea of Christian service. So the picture is very simple. We receive what we receive from the Lord, we are then to go and use for the good of others. Right? You remember Christ said, freely you have received, now go and freely give. And we see that playing out here in the order in which the Holy Spirit has inspired this text. We are given two from the Lord to go then and give to others. That is really the heart and the thrust of the Great Commission. Now, finally, very notable here in chapter 21 is we have the only recorded miracle of Christ after the resurrection. Okay? Again, the entire mission of Jesus between the resurrection and the ascension 
after the resurrection, but before the ascension. This all here is a training op. It's a training operation for the disciples. He is training them that although he will no longer be with them physically, he will be present with them and with them through the agency of the Holy Spirit. That while their relationship with him was physical, now their relationship will be spiritual. He wants to wean them now, wean them off of this idea of walking by sight, and prepare them to now begin to walk by faith. We saw the beginning of this in Jesus' dealing with Mary Magdalene, did we not? We saw it again with, with Thomas last week. You remember Christ, though being absent from their sight, he was really there, right? They can't see Christ. He's not there. And Thomas says, hey, I don't believe. I need to see A, B, and C. A week later, Christ appears and says, Thomas, here's A, B, and C. Exact same thing that Thomas was asking for, telling them, look, guys, though you don't see me, I'm right there with you. So this training up is continuing. The only post-resurrection miracle here in chapter 21 is going to be sending the boys the message yet again, all right? That while he had prospered them in the flesh, they could continue to count now on his provision even after the resurrection. And so we begin now our study of maybe my favorite chapter in all of the Gospels. Christ is training these guys in Christian service. There is a, a real training up here taking place and therefore an equally compelling training opportunity for you and for me as well. So let's dig right in tonight. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of the final chapter in the Gospel of John. Let's look at just verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Okay. Most of your translations have Tiberias there. This would be the Sea of Galilee. Tiberius was a Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. Now, notice he uses the word manifested there twice. You might have show or revealed in your translation, okay? Now, again, don't bring an NIV or a New Living Translation to a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. That's like bringing a knife to a gunfight, all right? We can ask me about that later. But in your better translations, you'll see this phrase twice here in verse 1, that he has manifested himself and then again at the end of the verse, he manifested himself or showed and revealed himself again. What John is doing is he is going out of his way and pointing this out twice that the resurrected Christ met with these guys on a physical plane. Okay? That he was not a ghost. That he was in fact flesh and, and, and bone meeting with these guys even after the resurrection. Now today, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was raised an invisible spirit being. Okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that he was risen from the dead as an invisible spirit being. And yet this is running contrary to the testimony of John and contrary to the very words of Christ himself. Again, Luke tells us in his gospel, chapter 24, that when the boys thought they were looking at a ghost, Jesus said, look, I am not a spirit Touch me and see, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses and some of these other cult groups, a cult, of course, the definition of that being denying the deity of Christ, right? Ultimately, have, they have the roots in this Gnostic heresy that John was combating and dealing with back in his day. John writes, we know, about three or four decades after the fact. At the time of John's writing, there was a group of people that were known as the Gnostics. They were really, again, getting, uh, getting off the ground in the first century. Of course, they would really begin to cause the church problems in the second century. The Gnostics believed that everything that was material was evil. So if you could touch it, if you could taste it, if you could see it, it was evil. Now, because everything material was evil, therefore, Jesus can't be material. I mean, how, you know, how could Jesus be made out of flesh and bone if flesh and bone are evil? So even in that Gnostic heresy, you can see the roots of the J-dubs, okay? And so John is going to great lengths to show us how that after the resurrection, after the resurrection, Christ still met with these men on a physical level, all right? 
Christ met with these men in the material world, all right? He was not a ghost, he was flesh and bone. All right, well, picking it up in verse two, we have a bit of a roll call here. Here's who's who on the scene. Let's read verse two. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Hmm. Notice two of these guys aren't named. Interesting. Well, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, right? And we've got Peter, Nathaniel, Thomas, and then these two guys who remain unnamed. I have a theory there. We'll get there in a minute. So we've got seven of the 11 disciples present and accounted for. Where are the other four guys? We're not told. Although it is interesting that seven of the 11 disciples are fishermen, and they're all accounted for here. Now, what we do know, though, and here's where I need you to really pay attention This is going to set the scene for the whole text, all right? What we do know from Matthew's gospel is that the second time that Christ revealed himself to them, he gave them very specific orders. He said, guys, I want you to go to Galilee, and there's a specific mountain there. I want you to go to that mountain and wait for me, all right? Matthew 28, 16. It's in your study guide. So their marching orders were to go to Galilee and wait on this particular mountain for Jesus to show up. Therefore, understand these guys are not where they're supposed to be. Okay? What we are about to discover is that these boys are going to commit the mother of all blunders. They are about ready to disqualify themselves to serve in the kingdom of God And yet Christ is just going to bring forth extravagant grace. This is why I believe, personally, I'm not going to the grave for this one, but this is why I believe the Holy Spirit has left the names of the other two disciples here anonymous, that you and I might insert our names and take our place with these rebellious renegades we're about to read of and learn from. Okay, and then, of course, ultimately be the undeserving recipients of extraordinary grace, even as they are. So what did they do? What is the blunder? Q verse 3. Let's look at verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go. We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. This is so rich. All right, well, here's Peter. Natural leader, right? Man of action. Probably had adult ADHD, definitely bipolar. So he's sitting around, he's bored to death, and he's saying, man, I'm tired of waiting around here. I mean, I can't just sit here. I'm going fishing. Now, understand that when Peter said he was going fishing, he doesn't mean I'm going to take a fishing pole and, you know, have a relaxing, spend a relaxing day on the lake. What Peter is saying is, I am firing up my business once again. I am going to go back to making money. I'm going back to what I used to do before I followed Christ. Now you remember that Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now you can go back to Luke 9 and study the context there, but Christ is saying, look, When you begin to follow me, when you begin to put your hand to the plow of discipleship, you cannot be fit to serve if you're longing to go back to who and what you once were. Now, three years before this, Jesus said to these men, walking by this same body of water, probably by the same boat, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now you follow me. That very day, the day they followed Christ, they put their hand to the plow, all right? They began to go forward with Christ. So what you've got here is the Lord had commissioned them to be fishers of men, not fishers of fish. Peter is wanting to take an excursion back into his old life here. The guys aren't where they're supposed to be. Now, The other guys aren't innocent here either, right? Notice Peter didn't have to twist anybody's arm here. We're told they immediately said, yep, we'll go with you. There was no, 
well, you know, wait a minute here, Pete. Don't you think maybe we should go back to the mountain? I mean, Jesus told us to go to the mountain. I mean, you know, there's none of that. Just, okay, yeah, we'll go with you. Listen, the problem with going off upon our own little excursions, the real issue of our swerving off the path of God is that others are going to be affected by our little detours. All right, men, the spiritual leaders in the home, this ought to hit you a little bit here. All right, so Peter's looking back here. The others follow suit. You remember the apostle Paul said, hey, I'm forgetting that which lies behind and pressing on towards the upward call in Christ Jesus. The danger of looking back, by the way, guys, is not just a New Testament concept, all right? Ask Lot's wife. Things got a little salty for her, didn't they? Right? Now, I also think it's interesting, underline the word night there, all right? The Holy Spirit is pointing out that it was night. This is a picture of what? The disciples walking in the dark, you see. Okay, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. Here they are, not following the program of Christ. Here they are, walking in the dark. Do you see the picture the Holy Spirit is painting here? Now, the result of looking back, the result of swerving off the path, the result of walking in the dark, notice the very end of the verse, they caught nothing. Get the picture here. Remember John chapter 15, a while back? Christ said, apart from me, you can do nothing. What did they catch? Nothing. Here they are apart from Christ, and here they are, therefore, producing nothing. All right. Well, now it gets very interesting, picking it up in verse 4. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 together. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. No. All right, well, Jesus shows up. We're going to discover down here in a bit that he was about 100 yards away. We'll see that in a little bit. They were not where they were supposed to be on that mountain, and yet Jesus comes to them. They're not expecting Jesus to be the guy on the shore. Now, several things here. First of all, notice the beautiful contrast from verse 3, which immediately preceded this. In verse 3, it was night. We had the disciples walking in the dark. Now, immediately at the top of verse 4, we are told it is morning. The light is emerging. Of course, who is there? Christ. You see that? A very poetic and telling picture. The disciples are running their own program. It's night. It's dark. Now we've got Christ in the morning. He is the light, right? I love that. I love that. He is the God of light. Now, initially also notice that these guys did not recognize him there at the end of verse 4. And of course, this speaks, are you seeing that? They did not know that it was Jesus. Initially, they will But initially, they didn't recognize him. And this speaks to how often you and I fail to recognize how near Jesus is to us. Okay, the disciples are a picture of us here. And isn't it interesting that acting in the flesh and following the wisdom of men is often the cause of this? Even as it is here? Nobody argued with Peter. Oh, you're going fishing? Okay, we'll go with you, you know. Acting in the flesh, following the wisdom of men. Now they don't recognize Christ. Surprise! There's a beautiful picture there, all right? Get the picture, guys. Peter swerves off the path, the others follow, and now nobody recognizes the presence of Christ. Are you catching this? All right. Now, the term children here, in verse 5, it means boys, I'm not trying to attack the NIV tonight, but it really blows it here. It does not mean friends. It does not mean fellows. Your better translations have the word children there. And in the Greek, this would speak of a young man that was still being tutored by his parent. Okay? So Christ is saying sort of lovingly with the authority of a parent, boys, have you caught anything? And they respond, no. Not very talkative, are they? 
right? Just like a kid, no, they talk a lot when they're two, believe me. I mean, just like a kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar, right? I mean, not very talkative, just no. These guys knew they were not where they were supposed to be. And listen, what Jesus is doing here is he is bringing forth a confession, all right? He knew they didn't catch anything. He is not making this inquiry in order to receive some piece of information, all right? What he is doing is he's drawing forth a confession. We'll get to that in a bit. Now, this excursion on the part of the disciples is a classic example of what we call non-directed service. Non-directed service, okay? And what I mean by that is we call Jesus the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Coming under his lordship means that we are doing what it is that he is requiring of us. Jesus said, Luke 6, why do you call me Lord and then not do what it is I tell you to do? When we serve the Lord, we can either bring forth directed service, doing what he's asking us to do, or we can bring forth non-directed service, doing that which men want to do and not God, okay? And I think that we see non-directed service in way too many ways to get into here. Let's just look at a couple of them. Number one, we can serve the Lord with the wrong motive, right? That's a form of non-directed service. I mean, you know, there are always people that want to present themselves as, as being spiritual so that the rest of us will ooh and ah at their spirituality, right? And of course, Christ warned us, do not do your works of righteousness to be seen by men because if you do that, that's your reward right there. There's no reward from your Father in heaven, okay? So you can serve the Lord out of the wrong motive. That could be a, a non-directed service. Another way we bring forth non-directed service is this. The church is faced with a problem, and so we form a committee, and we tell them, go fix the problem. They gather together, they talk about it for a while, and then what typically happens is they begin to follow the leading of the genius of men. All right? And it gets man's ideas and man's direction, and this is what we're going to do. In the early church, they were faced with a problem. Some of their widows weren't getting taken care of, okay? There was a problem. But they came to the disciples, and the disciples said, all right, well, let's put together a committee, but on this committee, get men of honest report who are filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom. Acts 6.3. You see, that way, when the direction comes, the direction is coming from men who are controlled by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit, and they are giving Spirit-led direction. And not just direction where we're sort of making it up as we go along, and, oh, I saw that in a business magazine somewhere, right? But we're following the mind of God. Now, by far the most tragic and global form of non-directed service that the church finds itself under today is that the church itself, by and large, just doesn't teach the full counsel of God anymore. Okay? The biblical program, the directed service, is to clearly teach the full counsel of God. In really the only elder-directed counsel we have in the New Testament, Paul tells the elders at Ephesus, look, I will have no blood on my hands because I taught you the full counsel of God. Now you go and do the same. Because there are people that are coming, there are wolves are coming that want to tear people away. Acts 20, 26 to 28. Today in the American church, we don't follow the full counsel of God, but we follow the wisdom of men. And what have we become? Not all of us, but by and large, the copycat church. Okay? If you go to a church that teaches topically, this isn't always the case, but most of them, you go to a church that teaches topically, and you go Google the name of the series... Chances are substantial. You will find a hundred other churches doing the exact same thing right down to the graphics and all the bullet points of the message, all right? And, and now what you've got, the only thing worse than canned ham, canned church. It's, listen, this is serious business, all right? 
God not only desires that we teach the full counsel of God, but Christ himself desires to speak very specifically to different churches, to different groups of believers who have among them very unique circumstances and unique challenges to where they're at, both spiritually and geographically. Study Revelation chapters 2 and 3. You'll come to understand that in very short order. All right? So we are to teach the full counsel of God and God desires not for us to be copying what everybody else is doing. You you can't speak to a local body of hearts that way. You're getting ripped off. Now, finally, in what we see here, the final way we'll look at this morning that we bring forth non-directed service is when we launch out into an area that we haven't been called to. All right? Like these guys right here, they're tired, They don't want to sit around. Let's do something. Isn't anybody going to do something? Let's at least get busy here. And so we get busy with activity that we cannot say with a pure conscience, this is what God has called me to do. And so we start serving in an area without really receiving anything from the Lord himself. There's a story out of the life of David, okay? You can read about it in 2 Samuel 18 where David was driven out of Jerusalem by his son Absalom, who had his eye on daddy's throne, okay? David had Joab, though, okay? Joab, the secret weapon, Joab, the killing machine. David tells Joab, hey, go and take out my son's men. Take out Absalom's men, but don't kill my kid, all right? He's still my kid. And then what I want you to do is to get a courier and send message back to me about how it went down. Now, do not tell a killer not to kill, all right? So Joab goes after Absalom, he defeats Absalom's men, and he kills Absalom. Then he takes a courier, and he says to the the courier, run to the village and tell David. After the first courier leaves, another courier comes up to Joab and says, send me, send me, I want to run. Joab said, dude, you're too late. All right, maybe I'll have some work for you in the future, but I already sent somebody. And the guy said, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, I, I want to run. I'm a fast runner. I really want to run. And he just persists and persists. And so Joab said, look, all right, look, you want to run, run. I don't really care what you do. And so the guy took off running, and the, the, second, cur- the second courier, the dude had some wheels, okay? I mean, he, ca- he catches up to the first courier, he passes the first courier, and he gets to David's house first, all right? David gets up, goes to the gate. The first guy gets there. David says, what happened? The guy says, I don't know. I saw a bunch of people, but that's about, you know, I don't know. That's about all I know. And David said, well, what do you mean you saw a bunch of people? What happened? He said, I don't know. Now, the word of God was presenting in the picture of the first courier of a picture of somebody that was running without a message. Okay, the word of God was painting a picture of somebody who was running who really hadn't been sent. He went, but he hadn't been sent. Guys, this is what our disciples are here doing. That's the picture that's being presented to us here. They sure are busy with activity, but they were, vo- they were involved in an activity that God did not send them to do, and therefore the result of this non-directed activity, complete failure. They accomplish nothing. All right? That is the picture the Holy Spirit is here presenting. Now, again, if I were Jesus, seeing that catch, if I were Jesus, I would have showed up on the shore and said, well, it's pretty obvious you guys haven't been watching Bassmasters, right? I mean, nice catch there, fellas. All night you got nothing. Oh, tell me about the one that got away, you know? And what in the world are you doing here? I told you to get up to that mountain. Do I got to recruit some new peeps? You know, and all of this kind of business. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Picking it up in verse 6, notice now how Jesus then addresses these men who are in rebellion, bringing forth non-directed activity. Notice verse 6. Let's look at verse 6 alone. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. That must have been pretty heavy. 
All of these guys together couldn't haul it in. Hold on to that. Well, here now we have directed service. Cast your boat on the right. Guys, the words of Christ directing the service, right? Now you have directed service, and the result is an abundant catch. But again, what grace, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't lower the boom on these guys like we would have. What grace? Here in this post-resurrection miracle, he is showing the guys that he's going to continue to provide for them even as he did prior to the resurrection. But notice what a difference it makes between being guided by your own desires and your own understanding and being guided by the words of Christ. Nothing, abundance. Too heavy for seven guys to even pull in. All right? Now, I want you to mark this very carefully. This gets back to the confession we talked about. Notice before he brought instruction to them in verse 6, back in verse 5, they had to admit, they had to confess their failure. Again, he knew they hadn't caught any fish back in verse 5 there, guys, but he asks the question to draw forth the, confe the confession. Have you caught any fish? No. We have failed. Listen, before he furnishes the abundant supply, we must fir first be made conscious of our emptiness. Before God works in our life, we have to come honestly before him, acknowledge our failure, repent of our sins, and then he will begin to bless our life. Are you seeing this? He knew they didn't catch anything. He's God. All right? He was drawing their attention. He made them confess their failure in order that he could then work in their life. Before the abundant blessing comes in our lives, guys, we must be brought to that, that consciousness of our emptiness. Okay? Now, it is amazing to me, you know, the boat's maybe five, six, seven feet wide, whatever, you know, the boat, they were six feet away from success. I mean, they were half a dozen feet away from success in this fishing endeavor. Ask yourself, how far away are you from success? How far away are you from God really blessing your life? I don't mean health and wealth and all that kind of crap, all right? But how far away are you from God really blessing your life spiritually and also materially if he sees fit? But these guys, they were, they were half a dozen feet away. How far are you away? You're only as far as confessing your weakness, confessing your failure, confessing your inability to be what he wants to be on your own, and then giving him obedience. That's how close you are. God has great blessings for you. They're right there. They're six feet away. But first, you, want, you need to be made conscious of your emptiness before him and acknowledge that to him. All right? That's the picture we got here. Now, notice why it's so important to give obedience to the words of Christ, beginning in verse 7. Let's look at verses 7 to 11. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about... 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it wow. and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Wow, Peter did it with one guy. Remember back in verse 6? Seven of them together couldn't do it. Interesting. Let's back up. You know, what we see here really, you know, picking it up in verse 7, it appears to be very consistent with what we know about Peter and John, right? John is the, the sensitive, contemplative. He's the first to recognize Christ. And of course, Peter, Mr. Impulsive, Mr. Bipolar, he's the first to act, right? But he is driven by love here, and so he just 
jumps right in and swims to shore, we assume. It's a little weird. I mean, we're told that, you know, essentially Peter puts, puts on his windbreaker before he jumps in. You know, most of us would do the opposite, right? But Peter's just, oh, Jesus, ah, you know, he's just, he's impatient in love, you know? He's impatient in everything else. Here he is in love. Now, this doesn't mean that Peter was butt naked here uh, when it says, you know, for he was stripped for work. I mean, these guys didn't work in the buff, all right? But basically what they do is they would take their robes off and sort of work in their boxers, if you will, all right? On the way to your expositional matters, okay. We have another incredible picture here being presented. I need you to get this. We just kind of alluded to it, all right? Notice back in verse 6, seven guys could not haul in this, this net full of heavy fish. And yet notice in verse 11, Peter is able to do for, by himself what the seven could not do together. Christ says, go get the fish. Peter wrestles the net to shore by himself. Now, does that then mean that Peter had the strength of seven men? No. What it means is, Peter was operating under obedience to the word of Christ. Christ said, go get the fish. Peter said, all right, I'll go get the fish. And now responding to the command of God, he found the power to keep the command of God. This is wonderful. Are you seeing this? Listen, God will never command you without making available to you the power and strength to keep the command. God will never ask you to do something without making the, uh, available to you the power and the strength to carry that out. That's what we see here. I had a guy come to me once and say, not too long ago, you know, I just... I can't take this woman I'm living with any, anymore. She, she's driving me nuts. It's, it's just an absolutely impossible situation. I don't know what to do. And I said to him, look, the Bible says you love her as Christ loved the church. And he said, no, you don't understand, man. This woman is from the underworld. I mean, I, I just, I don't know. You don't know what it's like. What are they doing? Arguing with the command of Christ. As long as you argue with the command of Christ, you're not going to find the power to bring forth obedience to keep the command. Are you hearing me? Okay? The moment you will to keep the command, the power to bring that command forth will be there. Do you remember the guy with the withered hand back in Matthew 12? Jesus said to the guy with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand, right? The guy with the withered hand didn't say, ah, I don't think that's going to happen there, Jesus. I mean, you know, I got kicked by a mule back at the farm or, you know, whatever. I mean, the guy could have given him all kinds of excuses on how he couldn't stretch forth his hand. But the moment his brain said, all right, I'm going to stretch out my hand, the strength and the power was there. What Christ commands you to do, he will give you the power to fulfill the command. Don't argue with the Bible. Just will to live the truth of the scriptures. Don't argue with God. Confess your inability to do it, but your desire to be faithful. Making sense? This is very powerful material, guys. Pray on all this this week, all right? Now, the Holy Spirit sees fit to record this detail for us very intriguing, says there were 153 fish. Why 153? Well, St. Augustine said, the number seven is associated with completeness, and the number 10 is associated with responsibility, and this is a story showing us how the disciples had completed their responsibility. Because if you take the numbers 1 through 17, because 10 and 7 is 17, but if you take those numbers between 1 and 17 and add them all up, you, know, you come to 153, which is true. If you add up 1 to 17, you get 153. But, okay. St. Cyril of Alexandria said, a hundred represents the fullness of the Gentiles. 
And then 50, you see, it represents the remnant of Israel. And, and three represents the Trinity. Uh, okay. St. Jerome of Italy said there were 153 different types of fish in the Sea of Galilee. And the Lord was telling them they have to be fishers of all types of men. Okay. St. John of Three Rivers is thinking, well, you know, maybe it's just telling us there's a whole lot of fish. All right. <laughs> now, what's more interesting to me is did you notice in verse 9 there that Jesus is already grilling their fish before the... He's already... There's fish there before they even bring the net in. Now, here's a little foreshadowing to next week. There's a cult of fire. Christ is about to ask Jesus three times, the same number of times he denied him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? By a coal of fire, what does fire speak to Bible students' judgment? That's for next week. But what's interesting to me is, is verse 9 tells us that there were fish already there. Right? Listen, here's some pasture for you guys. I like to leave you with some stuff. Um, to, to meditate upon and feed upon this week. Here's some pasture for you, all right? Remember, Christ told them they are to be fishers of men. The fish here are a picture of souls. The sea is a picture of the world, right? The souls, lost souls in the world, the sea being tossed to and fro, okay? And the shore where Jesus is standing is what? The destination, it's a picture of heaven. So the, soul, the fish are a picture of lost souls, be fishers of men. The waves being tossed to and fro are a picture of the world. And the shore where Christ is standing is a picture of heaven and the destination. Christ is showing us here that while we get the incredible honor and blessing of co-laboring with him and bringing souls to the shore, bringing souls to heaven, the Lord does not need human instruments to do that. You see the picture? The fish were already there, you see. We need to take this to heart in the age of the magnification of men, don't we? All right? Now, in this particular picture now, now I see some significance to the 153 fish, all right? In the sense that the Lord knows exactly who will respond to the gospel and come to the shores of salvation, right? Notice now, stay with me, the fish weren't numbered while the net was at sea in verse 6. It was only upon the shore, this picture of heaven, that they were numbered in verse 11. Speaking to this idea that we'll never really know the number of God's elect until we get to heaven, you see. Fantastic rich, deep text before you. Listen to this again when it comes out online. Spend some time this week. God will show you more. All right, well, finally now tonight, let's wrap it up with verses 12 to 14. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Isn't this amazing? I mean, they weren't where they were supposed to be. They're not supposed to be in a boat on a lake. They're supposed to be in a mountain. And again, this bears repeating. What does Jesus say to these guys? He doesn't say a bunch of goofy, waffling, unfaithful ingrates, Right? He doesn't chew them out in any fashion at all, but he says, come and dine. Come and eat. This is the third invitation now in John's gospel. Back in chapter one, he said, come and see. Chapter seven, he said, come and drink. Here now, he says, come and dine. Come and eat with me. Come and have breakfast. Understand in that culture, hospitality meant so much more than it does to you and I today. Hospitality was a, a, a prime vehicle of, of bonding. It was, a, 
It was a, a way to develop and establish intimate, intimacy with another human being. An invitation to eat back then did not mean come and shove food in the front of your head at my house. Okay? It means come and let's be intimate. Let, let's come to an understanding of one another. If I invited you in that culture to come and eat with me, I would be saying, come. I want to get to know you. I want you to know me. I, I, I want to be a part of your life. Do we recognize what an awesome privilege, what a tremendous invitation the creator of all things is offering to you and I. The creator of all things is offering you the invitation, come and get to know me. Come, let's have an understanding. I want to be a part of your life. I want you to be a part of mine. I want us to share intimacy. And yet, how often do we look at the offer we're being given here by the, the, the living God of the universe and say, well, whatever. We're just yawning. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the creator of all things is saying, I want you to be a part of me and I want to be a part of you. Come and dine. Again, this is the amazing love of Jesus Christ. Get the picture. This is Christ, the very living God wrapped in flesh, and now he's serving breakfast to the gang that can't shoot straight. I mean, it's not like they got to the shore, right? And, and Jesus said, well, get me something to eat or, or get me a pillow to put my feet on, right? I mean, it's not that Christ is making a, man that, making a demand that these men serve him, but he is serving them. Here they are, caught red-handed, not being faithful, and yet Christ is still being faithful to them. It's 2 Timothy 2.13, all over again. He is faithful when we lack faith because he cannot deny himself. This is extravagant grace. How many times have you and I been caught in the depths of our rebellion, and yet God has still remained faithful to us? And here he is, being faithful to these unfaithful men. As we close tonight, are you, do you understand that this is contrary to every religion that man has come up with, that this God of the Bible, this one true God of the universe is different from every other God that man could come up with? Do you realize how bizarre this is? I mean, here you've got Buddhism, Buddhism says, well, the whole problem is because, because you crave. No, stop craving and we won't have the problem anymore, all right? Hinduism says, well, you got to be born over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until you get it right. Islam says, well, you know, pray, keep the Koran and, you know, help the poor and, you know, make your pilgrimage to Mecca. And even then, I'm not so sure you're going to make it unless you blow yourself up. What does our God do? Our God says, look, I just want to be a part of your life. I want to minister my love and my healing to you. I want to, I want to make you whole. I mean, that's what our God does. You know, sometimes you go into a Christian bookstore and you'll see that picture of the wedding feast of the Lamb, right? And there's like this table, long table, and you know, the church is on both sides of it. And then there, there's Christ at the head of the table. Ever see that picture? That is not scripturally sound. That is poor artwork as far as theology is concerned. Because in Luke chapter 12, Christ is, Christ is essentially saying, hey, hey, this is what the kingdom of God is like. I mean, the kingdom of God is like a, a master who comes back after a far journey and he finds his servants being faithful. Those servants who he finds being faithful, he sets them down at the wedding feast. He girds himself and he begins to serve them. At the wedding feast of the Lamb, it is not Jesus sitting at the head of the table and we're saying, uh, yeah, Jesus, say, could you pass the mashed potatoes? I mean, it's Christ walking beside the table serving us. 
I mean, do you understand how foreign, how strange this God is, how completely opposite this God is from man's way of thinking? That's why John will say in 1 John 3, behold, what manner of love is this? What strange love. We, friends, have been the recipients of bizarre and unusual grace. And this great God of ours, he is giving you, he's giving me an invitation. Come and dine. I want to be a part of your life. Become a part of mine. Let's come to an understanding. I want to reveal to you who I am, and I want you to reveal to me who who you are. Let's develop an intimacy. This is the creator of the living, the living God offering us this invitation. Listen, God wants to bless your life, all right? God wants to bless your life. And we're so, oh, I can't receive God's blessing because I've just, I've been, I'm doing, I'm in this act of rebellion. Do you see what's happening here? Despite their rebellion, Christ is providing for them. His risen body has already atoned for their sin. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no condemnation here. He is showering them with unspeakable grace in the midst of idiocy. Don't ever think that you can't receive God's grace. Right now, today, I don't care where you're at. You're about a half a dozen feet away from success. You're as near as confession. You're as near as obedience. Just listen to the Lord. Allow him to do for you everything that he desires to do in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. You're so gentle and you're so long-suffering and you're so patient that you have died for our idiocy and you have died for our sin. And now you just long that we would come and dine and just be intimate with you, that we would get over measuring ourselves or thinking we're, we're not worthy to, to, to experience and reach out to you just because we're messed up. Lord, you died for that. You came to these men in the midst of their rebellion and you just didn't condemn them, but you provided for them extravagantly. God, I just pray you would give us hearts to, to, and, and eyes and ears to see and feel and understand the majesty of your grace. God, the scandal of your grace. I pray that we would walk out of here more in love with you than we are when we came. And I know I am. And I pray that for my brothers and sisters as well. Draw us, Lord. Draw us into your word. Give us a hunger. God, fill us despite us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.